Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of Patent Corner, or not. Um, today, we're taking a look at a publication that has a lot of illustrations about inventions uh, that uh, relate to electrical timekeeping. Now, uh, our favourite form of electrical timekeeping, which is a hill that I will die on completely, is that quartz uh, and uh, quartz clocks... Uh, the technology, the concept for how they work, that's amazing. Uh, do we appreciate them? Because they're just kind of little plastic octagons in the back of a cheap $2 dollar store watch. No, we don't appreciate them as they should, but we could. There is so much more we could be doing. So to start with, we have Electrical Timekeeping by F. Herb Jones. And if we take a look in the... Front, oh, we've got a note from the uh, author, which is uh, to Arthur A. Jackson, the pioneer of electric clocks in Australasia, from his friend, the author F. Hope Jones. So, very nice. We've already got some interesting stuff going on here. And if we take a look at the printing date, uh, this will have to be from 1949, uh, since that's the last listed um, uh, collection. Now, this whole book is great because we've got uh, everything from ordinary escapements. Ah, yes, here. Some very simple uh, how most clocks, early mechanical clocks, work. Uh, this little um, uh, escapement uh, is connected to the pendulum. And as that swings back and forth, tension on this wheel that really wants to spin because it's held in place by a spring or a weight uh, is as this rocks back and forth this catches into there lets it move one and then catches back there so back and forth and that's how we get uh, the ticking of a clock the sort of thing that really does it uh, in terms of uh, making these things work is synchronization so we take these early mechanical clocks and we provide an electromagnetic sort of uh, sensor. So every time the the pendulum swings, uh, it interacts with this electromagnet, which gives it exactly the same amount of push. So that means that your pendulum is now as accurate as could be. But we could still do that. right at the end of the book the quartz crystal clock. Now we've got uh, the actual uh, circuit diagrams for original uh, crystals. We've even got so the, the mass that is required to take how often the crystal oscillates to divide it, amplify it, use the motor which drives the clock, and that's done there as well. Now, what is great about all this is right here at the start, we have, I believe that at the present time, the nearest approach to perfection in timekeeping is provided by the oscillating quartz crystal clock, which is certainly free from the small irregular fluctuations and changes in rate to which the best free pendulum clocks are liable and which proves so troublesome in providing time to a high degree of precision. The use of quartz clocks, however, despite their superiority for precision timekeeping, is likely to be restricted to observatories or laboratories that are responsible for providing national sensors of time. They require much auxiliary apparatus which prevents them competing in simplicity with a pendulum clock. Now, basically, quartz will never make it in terms of everything. So that becomes apparent then, doesn't it? That quartz had been uh, known as a standard of time during this period where, where people were still making incredibly uh, intense mechanical clocks and stuff like that, but it was believed that it would not make it to the, to the size and uh, efficiency of other mechanical clocks that we had at the time. But it did, obviously. We live in a world where that is what happened. So, here's my thing. Here's my thing. It is amazing that the piezoelectric properties of quartz crystals, in that way that, like, providing electricity causes them to vibrate, which can then be measured, which can then be converted into and divided into the beats of time... That's a wonderful, a wonderful prospect, but we don't care anymore about trying to, like, if, like a mechanical, like a, this is still probably the cheapest that we've got in terms of 
uh, like a proper nice skeletonized movement. We've still got rubies and stuff in there, and and that's and that's lovely, and all, all for keeping time. But it's just like this is. <sighs> Let me get another. The backing off there. I think that's the backing there. Like, you can still see the blued screws. Focus bit. This one has a broken balance wheel. But just the that is put in two mechanical clocks. I mean, uh, oh, actually, I realize I don't have to be quite so salty. This is. The point of the whole video, uh, still the same format as 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 our usual ones. But look, little bits of metal, the little coil, the little capacitors and battery banks and stuff like that. This tiny little little nurse's pocket watch, like that. That's pretty. That's pretty. But I want this, and I want this. I want the 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 bastardized collection of both of these because we've got the technology and the know-how to build stuff like this and we've got the tech to build stuff like this so give me both i just i just want both they're both they're both beautiful one is the best handheld the timekeeping that we can do the other is a, a, a showcase of the beauty of craftsmanship that we are capable of as a species why not just just blend them just blend them maybe I'll blend them maybe I'll blend them I, mean, I love bricks as well in fact uh, I'd love to do just a very small little um, appreciation of bricks here right now Ta -da, I'm just kidding you think you can escape from Batten Corner, but genuinely, there's a lot of interesting things uh, to say about the uh, process of making bricks. Now, of course, we don't have uh, patents from the original creation of bricks because they've been used for thousands of years. However, um, the original uh, handmade process of making bricks and then the uh, machinery that was invented to make making bricks more efficient in around the 1860s is I think, personally, very interesting, uh, and it leads into a couple amazing sort of uh, procedures and stuff with architecture that I'd also like to talk about, so buckle in. So traditionally, bricks were made by taking uh, sort of clots, of clots of mud and then putting them into a wooden mould, patting them down, leaving them to dry just for a section, and then pulling them out of and that leaves you with bricks, kind of in that format. However... The 1860s saw rise to multiple machines, which, again, look look at, like, every time, every time I get a, the patent from, from this era, like, I just, oh, wow, the, the, we don't make them like we, so in here, we can see, uh, old bloke comes up with his, uh, clay and sand mixture, which would make our bricks, uh, that is milled and minced, taken out, uh, and then compressed. And now this is the interesting thing, is that uh, the creation of, like, the hydraulic press and the creation of, like, the brick manufacturing machine are actually kind of intrinsically linked because this was the most needed use for a full high-powered press because this clay mixture gets put into, into these sections, compressed into really nice uniform bricks, and then they are taken out and stacked. There are some other formats here. Uh, again, we're dropping in the clay up the top and out. But this process of making bricks and compressing them and then sending them off to get fired makes the whole brick industry just boom. Like, people are digging up more clay. People are putting it into these machines and they're able to churn out brick after brick after brick instead of the process of someone going to fetch the clay wheeling it in on a cart or wherever it is, mixing it up, putting it in a wooden mould, waiting for that mould to sort of slowly dry, pulling it out, letting it sit, because those are also kind of slightly inferior quality because they're not compressed and so they don't have as much structure. But these bricks, 
they're uniform and they're strong and they're easy to produce in the thousands. So, I mean, this type of building comes about when uh, we've got really, really easily mass producible bricks and we start seeing uh, a lot more. Obviously, this stuff exists beforehand. We start seeing a lot more of this really lovely, like, uh, multicolored brick details laid out super geometrically. Uh, these super beautiful and intricate, but like um, almost standardized buildings with this uh, easily replicatable format, the flat facades, all that sort of stuff. Stuff that becomes the the concept and and the blueprint for our sort of mass manufactured large uh, infrastructure style buildings paving the way forward so from this which we've been doing for thousands to this getting a little bit better in that pro to this in terms of the architecture we can produce to this oh actually yeah i i don't know what happened um it's still an easy building material it's still super prevalent and we've got a lot of stuff uh, I, I don't know. I'm uh, I'm on camp. Uh, brick has and can be utilized yeah, to a beautiful degree, um, but maybe it isn't so much anymore. We've got a lot of um, flat brick houses over here in Australia, and uh, they are domiciles. Although, to be fair, even in the past old uh these old brick buildings were not built equal um after the horrifying ordeal last year and where this brick building in iowa collapsed uh fatally uh taking the lives of three people it's uh they're not perfect and there's a lot of things that can be done better broadly speaking uh, in the terms of uh, making buildings that uh, look nice but are also actually safe and do not pose a fatal risk uh, to the people living within them and around them because, yeah, that's not... that's not great. So, yes, uh, I love brick. Brick is nice. Brick can be used in amazing ways. Uh, obviously, we've had that uh, amazing process of all the things that brick has turned into and become. However, uh, today it has its shortfalls, and even in the past it's had its shortfalls. So, uh, keep looking at bricks, keep finding uh, buildings made with bricks that inspire you, and keep thinking about how uh, things that are prevalent uh, these days, uh, where they came from, and what they were like before. G'day there, folks, and welcome back to Patent Corner. Today we're going to be looking at the history of uh, microfilm and microfilm readers. Now, if you've been watching my recent videos and you've seen uh, that I've been out and about and playing with um, some microfilm, however, uh, today we're going to be looking at where it came from, what it's been used for, what I think we could still use it for. Uh, so, that's all in. Buckle up. Let's go. So, in its simplest form, microfilm and microfiche are a way of taking a, uh, a large-scale image, uh, typically a document, something like a newspaper, like big proper broadsheets, um, and imaging them through some kind of lensing apparatus uh, and putting them on a strip of film. Now, because film has a basically like cellular level um, of, of detail, you can get things usually about 25 times smaller uh, than, than the original document, which means it's really easier to store rolls and rolls and rolls of newspapers and all that sort of stuff on a really, really space-efficient format. Although it was kind of a novelty thing beforehand, uh, René de Gron was given the first patent for microfilm in 1859. So that all eventually meant that they were able to actually send uh, really, really tiny messages um, across German lines on little carrier pigeons. So there we go. Uh, functional, I suppose. What I'm kind of interested in is this kind of point here is uh, the realization that um, with a little bit more funding, with a little bit more research, with all of these formats better in place, instead of just having to look at it through a microscope and starting to build machines, is that 
microfilm and microfiche are a really great archival storage method. So you see in the late 50s and 60s, academic libraries and research libraries expanding their activities and, and, and building on their microform uh, kind of archives, which leads us into these sorts of things. So this is a, uh, a form of a, a microfiche viewer. Microfiche as well uh, compared to microfilms. As microfilms is a roll. Like a sorry, like a, like a piece of like a roll of tape, basically, it's a roll of film. Uh, whereas microfiche uh, is usually on sort of index card size uh, or small any sort of form, uh, just flat cards, um, and they're usually used for forming uh, for filming and containing a series of documents that can then be put in. So this is a microfiche reader. So the actual uh, fiche is slid into there, and because of uh, the kind of optics mechanisms here. You can see, we've got like uh, uh, you put it in. There's a there's lenses. There's a light. There's a light bulb. There's a fan to keep the light bulb cool. The uh, image is placed here. It's rendered up through this uh, optical mechanism. Bounce, 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 and then that all comes out onto a, a sort of like a frosted glass screen, which means that you get a, a projection surface, which is really a lot of methods like this is a, a more of that microfilm roll roll pass through again that lighting and optic system uh, up to a plate this is actually a machine that's used for uh, copying and transferring or actually re-enlarging uh, the microfilm images or actually you know doing the inverse so all of these processes are usually built into quite lovely um, uh, sizes and formats so this is an example um, from my uh, trip to the uh, State Library the other day to actually test out some of their microfiche readers. And this is a an almanac from 1912. And you can see, like, even though, yes, there is, there is an amount of graininess, like, this image on the actual strip of microfilm is maybe, like, 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 like this big. Like, it's tiny. Um, probably even smaller than that, actually. The strips are only like that big and there's space on the, anyway but we get actually quite a crisp image and it means that you know where 50 60 70 what however many years ago this um physical paper uh made on uh you know like usually pulpy sort of stuff would have completely rotted away uh we've still got access to it so we can look through and see um dates which we obviously could calculate and stuff but um, occasionally, like, you'll have uh, last year was really good for planting these sorts of things. So maybe try this this year, like, information about the times and the periods in which these things were, uh, all these documents are from, which are now archived in catalogues. That's really good. And same in terms of old advertising and all that sort of stuff. Even there we are, labelled out kind of patentception, which is where we're up to now, I think. Like, microfilm uh, was a perfect way of storing information back in the pre-digital age but something that's really great about it is is there's this real tactility to it like when you're actually uh trying to search for a page you actually have to move the um plate back and forth and left and right to really focus on on the part of the image that you want to actually look at and i think you know we know that uh uh psychologically like um scrolling through information uh without uh, any sort of tactile response like you know writing it down or flipping through a book being able to see where it is um sort of damages our our knowledge retention in, in certain ways so having it in in that physical medium it's really fun uh is it going to be better than uh long-term digital storage maybe um it can last for you know up to 100 years if if, if the stuff's been taken care of and um advances in uh film like technology uh have actually made that better so uh where digital mediums can decay microfilm is potentially a way forward in terms of storing specifically just flat documents and stuff it's not as dense um what is a real benefit from it though is we can do all sorts of like artistic and creative things in terms of like something that i wanted to try doing is like as an artist i i, I draw a lot of uh, diagrams, art, and stuff like that that would fit that real art. They're best suited for black and white, you know. So we we'll really fit that style, line art, uh, architectural diagrams, uh, all that sort of stuff. What I think would be really cool is if I was having an art exhibition or, or you know, if maybe I was at a uh, market selling some of the other stuff that I'm making, 
uh, having a little microfilm reader there. So instead of going, oh yeah, you want to look at my art? Well, here's my Instagram or here's just a couple of sheets of paper. Um, I could have all of my works uh, laid out on a piece of film and that could be a really interactive process of people taking a look at what I'm doing. So like, I love uh, the, the tactility of it. And I think, you know, there's a lot of places where we could really work with. So worth a thought. This also ties into the next pattern corner video that we're going to do, which is on um, astrolabes, uh, planetariums, uh, starfield projectors, basically, and the original versions of that that weren't just uh, a normal digital projector, because I think they're really cool. But they also form uh, on the basis on taking a sheet, projecting light through it, and seeing what happens there. So that uh, is going to be us for today, and we can do some more of this in the future. Thanks for watching.